Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Digital Savages Challenging the Status Quo podcast with your host, Amir Sabirovich. In the previous episode of Challenging the Status Quo, we had the pleasure of interviewing Melvin Cho Nai as the challenger of the status quo. And here's a short part of our conversation. Um, well, I've learned the hard way that um, success also means a steady income focusing on that those things which bring you income and being able to pay the bills so um, along the way we are trying to focus on those things which are for us important and uh, to build a solid business case for instance uh, we had a membership of the other network and we did a lot of events and it was really nice but it, it costs a lot of time and it didn't bring in any money. So now we're focusing more on recruitment, placing people at, we have our own traineeship, and it means that people are employed by us for 12 till 18 months, and then can uh, are employed by the company, like. Are you curious about the rest of Melvin's story? Go one episode back, listen to what he has to say about health, life, entrepreneurship, and falling and raising as a company owner. For now, Let's focus on our next guest. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Challenging the Status Quo. Today, I have a far, far away guest. He is International School Science Coordinator and International Junior High Science Teacher in Wuzi, China. His name is Goran Barbir, and let's hear his story. Welcome, Goran. Nice to have you on the show. Hello, Amir. Again, thank you very much for having me here. It's still very weird for me to be in this position because I think I have way more questions for you than you would have for me. But if anybody finds my brain pickings interesting, I'm more than happy to offer them. (laughs) You're just being modest. (laughs) uh, (laughs) Gora, you have listened to a few of the podcasts and you know how the drill goes. So Can you, you know, tell us about your background story and how you got in China? Uh, And don't spare us the details, please. Well, yeah, that's, it's kind of a story, obviously, that almost everyone has. Oh, China, wow, how? Then also when they see that I'm not alone here, I'm here with my wife and daughter and a dog and another kid coming soon. So it's kind of like, oh, wow, Like you even decided to move your family here. But it kind of always comes down to personal perspective. It it seemed possible to me and it seemed feasible to me at the time. And I never had any kind of major obstacles in my my way to China. And it's been great since the day one. I can't really say, oh, it was a bad decision and it was horrible. But then I... Then I stood up with my incredible powers and my bootstraps, and now I'm enjoying my life. Coming to China was probably the the single most important and the best decision. I also don't think only for me, but for my entire family, which is the central piece of of, 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 of my doings. It's almost everything I do. It's kind of like, okay, what kind of impact will that have on my family? So... um, I was born in Mostar, um, raised in Chaplina and Metkovic, so on both sides of the border between Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia, deep south. A lot of outdoor time as a child, uh, sports, water sports, rivers, seaside, everything is kind of, everything is around there. So it was tricky. There There were a lot of challenges growing up in a city, just after the war the war started in the same year when i was born it definitely changed a lot of things that i wasn't even aware my parents were definitely shocked and they're still kind of sometimes in conflict with post-war reality and now when i also reflect on kind of as a parent in approaching the ages that my parents were when the war started like i can't imagine how difficult it was for people to come over. So there was a lot of challenges that now I kind of just take as an advantage um, in my Far East adventure. And that Far East adventure happened at the end of my college studies. 
So after my uh, primary and secondary education in Chapin and Metkovic, I started bachelor and then master's degree at um, petroleum engineering, oil and gas mining, geology, uh, university in Zagreb, of course, University of Zagreb. So my kind of dream was at that time, very, very silly dream and very stupid dream for quite a bright student. But when I was making my uni decision, it was kind of what can give me an easy life with an easy degree. So I didn't pick my my battles uh, according to what I believe in today. But so I ended up in a, in something which I believed is going to bring me a lucrative future with a lifestyle that looked cool for me at the time, you know, offshore rigs, uh, very loud engines, smell of fuel and all that. Again, there's so many things that have changed in the meanwhile, and we can talk about them through the podcast. But yeah, I found myself finishing something that I didn't really deeply care about. Um, I was already a father of a very young lady, and it just suddenly looked like there are no options where I was at the time in Zagreb. And through just pure, pure luck, China was mentioned in a couple of con- conversations with my friends at the time. And I ended up here and I ended up teaching, teaching professionally. I was doing some part-time teaching in Croatia and I always loved sharing knowledge and seeing the spark and all that. And now I can truly say like, this is a, this is a great profession and passion and I'm enjoying it. All right. And can you elaborate how the life in China is? Because, you know, you can read about it, but you're living it. So it's for, for most people that are living in the Western part of the hemisphere, meaning Europe, it's kind of always a distant um, environment to be and uh, to do business in. Well, and uh, again, I can only offer opinion from my current perspective, from my current city. China is a huge place with so many differences on, on in different places, geography, cuisine, mentality, even languages, of course, local languages are completely like you can't understand somebody from a different part of China if they use their own local language. So there are just so many differences. But what can I see from my own perspective is, again, in my international bubble where I am now, life seems quite easy in terms that uh, most important things, the foundations of your life are kind of like quite easily taken care of and you can focus your efforts your efforts can be more focused, more targeted. You're not, again, it's it's not only for me being in China, but you're not kind of spending your, your brain power over polit- politics and, and, and decisions. People here believe their government. They have seen some huge leaps in the last 30, 40 years. They can see that their the future of their children and their own lives look much better than they could imagine as when they were kids. So you have kind of largely positive mentality, largely positive culture where people are being like they are taken care of. Uh, the system always does something. Of course, like in any other country, you can sometimes argue, oh, is this the smartest thing that they are doing? Maybe they could do something else, but things are moving and things are moving on a large scale. I think everybody who is who just went to visit any place in China and came back a couple of years later, you you just end up shocked. Like, how is it possible that so many new buildings are here? Complete landscapes are changed in a, such a short time. So it's it's an interesting place to be it's always moving it's very easy to move between cities there's a huge fast bullet train network and life in china is just very convenient for myself and i also think for many people who have came who came from western countries let's say and and how does the university look like i believe you told me previously that uh, it's a 
it's a Western university that is actually set up there. I cannot recall the name anymore, but uh, uh, what is it like to be a teacher on the on that kind of university? Well, it's not university. Maybe maybe you got me wrong somewhere. It's a it's a from KG to high school all the way up to university. So we are basically mostly dealing with students who whose parents and students who want to get more international, more broad-minded education. And most of our high school students are going to study in US or UK or Europe or Australia or some um, Western universities. So in terms of what do we teach, I don't believe it's a, it's a much different story than any international school. And uh, we are we are basically a British school. We are a kind of affiliation. We affiliated with uh, King's College at Wimbledon, one of the most prestigious international schools. And um, we are kind of taking the best of British and international education and combining that with local Chinese uh, values and educational philosophy to create something that I believe can help young people to survive better in modern world, no matter where they find themselves to be in future. And, and, and moving forward, you said you didn't have any obstacles. And what what is your definition of success? When are you successful and how you feel about that? Oh, well listening to many of your podcasts and many of wonderful people with wonderful answers obviously i was like oh like what is your definition and there's at least one thing i learned about myself and that's that my definitions are constantly evolving so the one at this moment is basically taking care of people around me i have found that i can't be successful no matter what do i think about myself how good do i feel with my day with my flow and productivity and uh, achieving my goals and good habits that i want to make if kind of main people in my life haven't been satisfied so to be successful for me means that you are doing a good work consistently in any of your roles and my current roles are to be a parent to be a husband to be a teacher to be a son to be a brother to be a friend and i just try to reflect at the end of every day okay like how well did you fare in each of these roles and if in most of them i did my best i feel accomplished and successful and again i hope and i believe in theory that those little things, those little successes are going to compound and provide a compound interest in life. And that one day there will be something big and large that you can say, oh, this is what has been made over the last 20 years, but it was made through these little and small, uh, sometimes boring, consistent habits. Hey, and um you, you said um, your travel to China was, you know, a good option and you moved, but um, finishing your college or maybe even earlier in your career, if, if you could advise yourself to do something. So if you could go to your young self and give him some piece of advice from the point you're standing right now, what would that be? Oh, there would be so many advices. But again, there is a I, 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 I came to peace with my uh, mistakes and uh, wrong decisions in the past because, again, those wrong decisions brought me here. And if I had a different kind of uh, mindset or different kind of outlook, I wouldn't probably end up here. And again, who would, who would, there is no way to guess, would that be better or worse? But I was definitely, I wasn't focused on what. I can do, but I, I, I was largely influenced by all the limiting factors. I was way more negative and complaining about the system and corruption and uh, there is no room for young people and blah, 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 and blah, 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 and blah, blah. Again, those things are true, unfortunately. You were struck by the, you were struck by the Balkan syndrome. Oh, exactly, exactly. And I, and I still am. And uh, I, I, was, I was talking to you and I'm kind of uh, building a... a, a, a 
a structure, a mental structure for coming back home, coming back to Balkans one day. But I'm completely aware that there is so many factors that are external, but throughout, through, through, through work of time, they become internal. And I was definitely, I wasn't aware there. I only became aware of my, my own limitations that I put on myself only when I came to China and when I saw that there are people who are not having this, who are not looking at themselves as powerless products of situation or whatever. And again, that's a, that's a super interesting topic to, 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 to read about and to study more. But definitely, if I would summarize it, it would be, come on, believe in yourself, focus on things you can control, start with small, good habits. You can't expect to, 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 to be good at anything if, you're, if, you're, if your life balance is completely distorted, if you're not having good eating, sleeping, exercising habits. How can you... How can you put any kind of hopes in you? And again, there's also that kind of mentality where change is not something that you embrace. There are so many songs and so many people who are, you know, like taking pride into like, I will always remain the same. And you kind of think that, you know, like you're cool. You're like, you're a rock type, solid person if you are not changing under the circumstances. But then you realize if you're not evolving, if you're not changing your 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 viewpoints, perspectives, you just decay you, because time is going by and you are staying in the same place, right? Yeah, that's like uh, like going backwards, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you do not evolve. Yeah, there there's a there's a good Jewish proverb proverb that says if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. There is no there is no status quo in life. You can't stay the same. No. That's a, that's a nice one. No status quo in life. You have to challenge uh, all your beliefs and focus on those things that you can change, which are in, within your power. And actually, what's, uh, what comes from the external factors, you should just forget. And exactly. What do you do to challenge the status quo on a daily basis? Well, it basically kind of continues on what have I been talking about there are so many small leaps of faith that I take with full awareness every day. You know, you find yourself like, oh, there is something that I have no idea how to do. And I can just say, oh, like, I'm I'm not good for that. I maybe should look for advice or pay somebody to do it. Or just say, okay, what's going to happen if I give myself half an hour and try? Just try. Don't think about it. Don't. Don't plan how to do something, just do. So challenging the status quo just as for me is all those mini victories you get by saying, oh, look, I did that and it's not perfect and it's not amazing and it will never be. But I can do that and I have once again showed myself I can do that. But again, the key, the key word is do. And uh, I was tricking myself before and so many people do that as well you know you replace doing with with you replace action with thinking about action planning action lo- waiting for the perfect moment and all that and just like putting all that aside and trying to do something is basically for me what means to challenge the status quo on a daily basis yeah people tend to overthink and by the time they want to act the life has passed and they're in their pension time exactly exactly Exactly. You're like, there's always like, um, one of the small things I do, uh, recently I've been trying to put some, I I print notes and then some written reminders for myself just to create my environment in a way that's going to constantly remind me of something. And on my, on my entrance door, I put, I put a John Lennon's quote that basically says that, that life is what happens where we are planning to live or something like that so yeah yeah that's um i i, bl- I recall that quote from uh, i don't know if you watched series wired oh yeah oh, and there was a or- conversation there was a co- conversation between the, the detective uh, and uh, and jimmy and he goes like jimmy you know what life is is the shit that happens while you wait for the moments that never come that 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 could be only two guys that could be bunk morland or 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 lester freeman nobody else right 
I believe that's Lester and the other guy. I cannot recall his name. Uh, the young detective, uh, uh, Jimmy Jimmy McNulty. Don't go to wire, man. Oh, we we can we can. <laughs> Hey, uh, uh, Goran, is there is there a, a failure, or I would I would call it the biggest learning moment from your from your life, where you said, "Hey, this is something that, like your epiphany." Where did you bump your head the hardest? Um, I wouldn't say it was the hardest, but um, so I was always a good student. Like school, academic success, that always came quite easily. And when I look deeper to that, that's just because that our educational system is flawed. And one thing that I enjoyed and I still enjoy is voraciously reading whatever, like just reading. And I was always good with reading and keeping trivial things in my memory, even though they were useless. So we, our system is rewarding students who can memorize road facts. And I was always being rewarded by uh, good grades on, on any level, even university, I really didn't feel a lot of academic stress with exams. Everything was kind of flowing. And you kind of build the false confidence that you're good with something and that's going to translate into a good future and a good work and somebody's going to recognize that. And then I started going for like for job interviews. Again, there's the first mistake is I was going for job interviews, for jobs which were giving me a good money or money that would enable me and my family to live a life that at the time we, we wanted to have. But there was no, first of all, there was no passion. There was no, what do you really want to do? What are your skills? What do you care about? It was just like, oh, give me something. Give me, give me a paycheck. And obviously I didn't fare very well at some of my first uh, some of my first interviews and some jobs that I was like, oh, like, yeah, sure. Like I can do this. Like I'm going to get this job and I wouldn't, you know, like you would go for interview, maybe one, two, three rounds. You would be like, oh yeah, like I'm, I'm in deep cycle and you wouldn't get it. And obviously that led me to question myself. Hey man, you're maybe not that good. Like you only have one good skill. Your good skill is reading. Like you're, you're, you don't know how to, you don't have, I don't know, so many skills that are key today you don't have any work related skill that you can say oh i can do this not at an advanced level but even at the beginner level and so there were a couple of failures and there was um there was a time when um i i, I went to the last round of 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 air traffic control and obviously that's that's one of my that's one of my dream jobs and i was completely infatuated with everything and they they have very rigorous process and I came uh, to the last round, and not the last round, the the round before the job interview, but it was already like fourth, fifth kind of different thing where different people from like psychologists, former air traffic control officers, everybody is kind of checking because it's such a important and responsible job. And they were assessing our group work. And they put you in a team of, six seven eight people that obviously you never met before and they give you a task and there's a bunch of people with with boards around you and like just taking notes and asking you questions trying to provoke you asking quite you know like ugly questions and they try to kind of put you off your balance and i think i did great at that teamwork like i was organizing everything we we finished like uh, ahead of time we all like every member of the team did what was achieved. Uh, I was I was flying, you know, and I was like, oh, like I, I feel so good. I'm going to get this job. Like I'm going to have amazing job in Croatia. Like I won't need to think about leaving to Germany, Ireland, China, whatever it was, because leaving was the only option already. And that thing was kind of like, oh, but like if I get this, like I'm staying here. I'm, I'm going to enjoy my beautiful Balkans and like never move. And then obviously, like, I didn't get the job and uh, the, the committee or the people who were in charge, there was one lady, like, like the HR officer and psychologist, and they were like, don't get us wrong. Like, you, you're not, we don't think you're a good fit for this, but you're going to be a great fit for everything else. And believe us that, you know, like, once in a life, you will say like, oh, thank you for not accepting me here because 
You don't have the profile for this. You are way too passionate. You're way too committed. You're way too kind of like loud and, and you're great with teamwork, but we need people who are not going to get upset when it matters the most. And the analogy they use is like people who are air traffic controllers, they they need to kind of like have an attitude that instead of 200 passengers in a plane, there is like 200 tons of potatoes and I don't care what will happen with potatoes. So I can't make emotional decisions. I have to make rational decisions. And it was just one of like, not only one lesson, not only one mistake. It was an accumulation of kind of different checkpoints that at that time I was also not taking in a most positive way. I was just getting more kind of like closed and more like, oh, like there's no room for me. What can I do? And I can basically say I escaped to China, you know, like I run away. And then I realized, oh, it wasn't all about Croatia and Balkans. And like, there was so much about you. Yes, of course, I skipped a couple of steps because I completely changed my environment. And my environment in China was always very positive. And I'm so grateful to, to be surrounded with so many amazing people who, are, who I have been learning from since. And I still learn. So not a single big learning moment, but accumulation of them that still that still happen. Coronavirus, amazing learning moment. <laughs> Yeah, if you, if you skip the chance to learn from everything that is actually challenging, then you you live your life like a zombie. Exactly, exactly. And again, I, I can't I can't remember who it was, but uh, one of the was it a podcast or 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 a, or a video lesson that said you know like just the small things like replace word mistake or failure with a learning moment with. I didn't fail at this. I learned how I shouldn't do the next time. Those simple, small changes that I embraced uh, have been so powerful. And where do you get your inspiration from? Uh, again, very, very, very complex question. I <laughs> for some moment, very short but complex. It, it's very, it's very complex. But again, I would, I would get, I would, I would combine it with what I told you about success. Uh, it's not about me. I have my roles and somebody needs to fill those roles and somebody needs to do a good job at those roles because people who are at the receiving end need somebody, right? My daughter needs a responsible father who is going to help her, who is going to give her a toolbox to prepare her for future. My students don't need somebody who doesn't care for them. They need somebody who is going to, some responsible adult who is going to show them the way. I need to be a role model in one way. My parents are not going to be happy if they talk with me across 10,000 kilometers and they hang up the phone and say to each other, oh my God, like, who is this guy? Like, did we create this lazy person, monster, whatever? You know, like, it's not about me. My inspiration comes from what I want to do, what I want to achieve, who I want to be every day, how do I want to perform, right? And that's a, that's a nice bridge to what would you like to leave to the world? Again, um, I was, uh, if you have, uh, my other passion is everything related with history and archaeology. And I was dreaming about becoming an archaeologist and I was winning state competitions in history and and again, I didn't follow my passion because at, at, at age of 18, 19, I would say, oh, you know, like, there's no money there. You like, you're not going to be able to afford anything and so on. So that part is somewhere hidden away, but it's still kind of thing that I, I read about and I'm fascinated. And if you ever heard about uh, Fenn's treasure, there was a, there was a, a kind of a gold hunter, adventure hunter with very dubious reputation today because a lot of his artifacts and a lot of his wealth came from basically robbing graves and robbing uh, native cultures all around the world from their artifacts. But he, he, he put um, a stash or, or a chest full of treasure reportedly worth up to $2 million somewhere in, in, in deserts in Nevada or Arizona or whatever. And he wrote a song which has all the clues for people to find that 
to find that treasure. And obviously, a lot of people he became instantaneous. Instantly, he became quite famous. And people have been asking him, like, oh, why did you do that? And what struck me was his explanation, which now just came to mind when you when you asked this question. He said, oh, my father was a, a school principal and he was very passionate and he was very well respected. But like today, nobody can remember him. Like I gave a reward of two million dollars and it's called the fan treasure. And like people will always talk about me. And for me, that was like a checkup, you know, like, oh, that's definitely not the legacy I'm aiming for. To be honest, I'm not aiming for any legacy. I just try to be day by day. But of course, when you kind of like reflect, why am I doing all these things? What do you hope for? I just hope that my small individual actions are going to accumulate and that people who I deal with are going to be successful and positive and good and just spread the circle. And there's a good thing that's kind of, that's immeasurable, right? So I can, I can, I can sell the illusion to myself. <laughs> I don't care what happens. If I say, if I I'm doing good things. People that I do good things with, they are going to do that. The same thing with their kids, with their students and everybody will be happy. Right. Yeah. It's paid forward methodology. Yes. I'm like right that. Yes. Yeah, I'm totally aligned with that. What are you curious about right now? Uh, right. I'm always kind of, um, again, as I told you, I've been reading my entire life, but recently, I don't know, is that because of me or I'm, I've been choosing great books? Um, I basically read a great book and then I kind of take some key points and try to apply them. And just a couple of days ago, I have finished and I, and I went immediately, I went like, to, to reread it. And then I went through all the key points and notes. The book is called Atomic Habits. And I have been um, receiving that a newsletter from James Clear for a while now. But again, you know how it goes. You always make excuses, no time, no time to read the book. And I finally found time and I went through book twice. And I'm just, I'm, I'm currently printing, uh, you know, cheat sheets, fact sheets, about how to build some habits in a way that he presents in a book and I quite align with and I quite agree with. So that's my current source of curiosity. Oh, can you really kind of trick yourself and program yourself into building good good habits more easily and at the same time getting rid of bad habits more easily? And that's, again, probably an eternal topic. <laughs> it's uh, continuously challenging yourself exactly hey goran if i would give you the possibility to dine with three people alive or dead who would those three people be oh man uh, i i knew this question was coming and i was just like i, I would think about it and i was like well what was the point of this what 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 would i get okay like let let's let's put somebody like so huge in history what if I couldn't understand those people? What if, you know, like the, the frequencies that we are right now, what could I talk? For example, very high on my list would be would me Mahatma Gandhi. And then I would be like, well, what can I what can I get from Gandhi? Like there's already all the works. I can read everything about Tesla and then like so many fascinating people. And then I was like, well, I honestly have no clue about our ancestors who who we are obviously identical genetic copies of people who maybe lived in Balkans in 18th, 19th century. For me, that was like, oh, wow, you know, like we know stories from our grandparents and all that. And to be honest, probably life didn't look much differently in Balkans. Like there has been no <laughs> change between kind of a fall of Roman Empire and, and, and I don't know, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, something like that. It was very slow process, but I would like to find some of my ancestors who was born in the same place and just, you know, like get inspiration from all the daily hardships that they had to endure. Let's say my great 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 grandpa would be maybe a good person, or even more important, my great great grandma, because again, we come from a place where. Uh, boys tell the history because boys do wars and ladies are 
ladies were sitting at home and waiting and praying and they were the real champions and the real, like, you know, somebody who had to show up every day. So that would definitely be like some of my ancestors would be person number one. Um, being so far from home, um, I haven't been home since February and I won't be going home till next summer. I already know that. So it will be a year and a half till I'm, till I'm going to have a chance to, to, to see my parents and my friends. My parents would definitely be a, a number two. And a number three would be my sister. She is in Bolivia. And I haven't seen her in almost three years. And she's my only sibling. So actually very simple choices. Like uh, when I kind of put the filter down that I can probably learn everything from giants that I'm already learning. I would just focus on people who I haven't had chance to see much recently or ever that's a beautiful list <laughs> thank you not heard before not heard before <laughs> thank you so it's unique hey goran we have come to the end of the podcast so you know this question is coming up also so could you please summarize everything we have talked about in a few sentences and um, give us your key takeaway that you would like to share with the audience uh uh where the, the, there is a there is a fancy term that I'm I'm I I don't know I haven't actually googled have I invented that but I've been starting using that with my wife in our philosophical discussions and I call it multi axial balance you know like it's not just enough to be balanced in one way there's like so many different axes so many different directions and parts where you have to make sure just to be right in the middle so that's my kind of not my takeaway for 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 listeners only but the central part of my life obviously i have to have a balance between caring for myself and people around me i have to have balance between being committed to work and having a good balance and just balance key word key takeaway be balanced in whatever you do uh if you're not Maybe you won't see it right away, but I'm sure, you know, like there's so many things in the long run that are in front of us and we have to take care about them as well. Well, I think that is a nice uh, resume of everything. Balance is important. Yeah. If you have the balance and you combine it with focus, exactly. you can do magic. Exactly. Well, on. it was awesome talking to you and thank you for uh, plugging in from such a distant place. I wish you all the luck in your end of wars and, of course, in your successes in the Balkans as well. Thank you very much for having me here. Again, I have to, I have to finish by just uh, expressing my gratitude to you and to a number of people that you have been bringing to this same podcast that have been such a great source of, of learning and empowerment. Uh, I probably listen, like, again, I sometimes have holes, of course, but there's probably not a week where I don't listen to some of your podcasts and some of your guests have sparked, have mentioned the book or idea or something that I have taken through my filters. And it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's a brilliant podcast to put it simply. I am a huge podcast fan and this one has been my, my inspiration since the day one. And to be honest, I still don't believe that my name will be up there because it's it's it, you have great people and you're doing great things and keep up with them thank you Th thank you so much goran it was great talking to you thank you very much for listening dear ladies and gentlemen this was goran barbir join me next week for the conversation with yuri schumacher he's the inventor and founder of peter pot and here's a short part of our conversation. Well, that's actually in the beginning why we thought we always want to have delivery in-house. We want to deliver ourselves, just like Picnic does with their own uh, small cars. And that, that's actually why we sat with this issue. Because if we couldn't get it uh, viable economically in one city, how is anybody going to invest in our, in, our, in our idea for another city? In hindsight, Amsterdam or Utrecht. Are you curious about the rest of Yuri's story? Tune in next week and hear everything he has to say about entrepreneurship and starting a new business from nothing. For now, this was Challenging the Status Quo Podcast Season 2 
with your host Amir Sabirovic. Stay safe and healthy and until next time, see ya!